being pressed for time. So maybe we'll just give it a couple more minutes to let people find their way to their home office here, and then we will begin. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, Martha, maybe if you stop sharing your screen, I'll have the option again to share mine. It, it's gone away. Okay. It looks like I can make you the presenter. Okay, there we go. Okay, there we go. Good. All right. Well, I know we'll get a sprinkling of folks uh, trickling in here as we head into the nine o'clock hour, but um, hi everyone. It's so good to see all of you again. Um, I hope we're all kind of trucking through and getting through this coronavirus. And um, thank you to those that have reached out in the last few weeks and uh, to explore possible opportunities to collaborate and. Um, I'm kind of missing our in-person ED summits and our ability to kind of ping pong and brainstorm together, but this will have to do for the time being. Um, again, hope all is well. We know that there have been a lot of questions around CARES Act funding, so we wanted to take an opportunity to facilitate a conversation to not just get an overview of CARES Act funding. Lisa Sova from the League of Minnesota Cities is here today to answer any questions that you may have in terms of use. And so she'll, she has a few slides she's going to present and then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, but we also want to make sure you're aware that at any, oh, yeah, per Martha, at any point in time too, you can use the chat box for questions as well. Uh, but really this is an idea to say collectively between all of our various jurisdictions, how can we be strategic in the use of these CARES Act dollars? We know that there's a lot of uh, there are a lot of guardrails and guidelines and restrictions in terms of use, and we also know that we're kind of crunched for time in terms of deploying these resources as well. Uh, so we just want to take an opportunity to brainstorm today, collaborate when where possible, and with that, I think we'll skip the kind of formal introductions that we typically do since we've got a lot of uh, kind of content on the calendar this morning. After Lisa, uh, we will head into a presentation from Joe Minicosi from Urban 3, and he will talk about, do a deep dive into a fiscal health analysis of the county. Uh, so uh, uh, if you could just turn your attention to Lisa and I'll, I'll let you take it from here. Great, great, thank you. Thanks so much for inviting me today. Um, I'm gonna give you a brief overview of the CARES Act funding rules and regulations. And uh, this is an ever evolving topic. So things are literally changing daily, but I will share with you what we know as of today. So my name is Lisa Silva. I'm the Assistant Finance Director Outreach with the League of Minnesota Cities. And I've got my contact information on the screen and feel free to reach out if you have questions after the presentation, I'll do my best to help. Um, CARES Act funding is named after, or the acronym I should say, um, stands for Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Securities Act. The first thing you need to do to receive your CARES Act funding is to apply. So um, your city will apply to using the Minnesota Department of Revenue. So go to the Department of Revenue website, type coronavirus in the search bar. A list will pop up and the first item on the list is the Coronavirus Relief Fund Certification Form. You pull that form up, fill it out. It's a very simple form. Um, you have to have your SWIFT number, which is a a state assigned number, but you'll fill that in, certify, sign it, save it, and then email it to propertytax.admin at state.mn.us. An important date to remember is September 15th. That is the deadline. If you don't certify by September 15th, your city will not receive those funds. So keep that date in mind. The funds are distributed from the Department of Revenue. Um, on a, a, a rotation. So there are a number of dates that uh, you can certify by. Um, for instance, the next upcoming date is July 31st. We've had three of the certification dates passed so far. So if you certify by July 31st, it takes six to eight days for that money to come to your city. So you can expect the funds to uh, arrive between the 10th and the 12th of August. If you miss that 
July 31st date, you've still got opportunities August 14th, August 28th, and then September 15th, again, the deadline. The funds will come to your city following the same path that you normally receive state funding. So if you qualify for LGA in your city and that money is typically deposited directly to the city's checking account or savings account, the, these funds will come that same route. If normally you receive a check from the state, you can look for a check for your CARES Act funds as well. The CARES Act fund uh, payments require that three elements be met. And you'll hear this over and over because the three elements apply to any use of CARES Act funding. The first element is that the expenditure must be necessary due to the current COVID uh, pandemic. So we can't use it to plan ahead for the next pandemic. It has to be for the current pandemic. Second, the expenditure cannot be accounted for in your most recently approved budget. And for most cities, that budget was approved in December of 2019 for 2020. Some cities amend their budget on occasion. If you have amendments to your budget, you look at March 27th of 2020 as the line in the sand. Whatever budget you had in place as of March 27th of 2020 is the, the guideline. So if you have an expense that was included in that budget, then it won't qualify for CARES Act funds. But anything that was not included will qualify. And most of us did not have a pandemic on our radar when we did our 2020 budget. So that one is pretty easy to meet. And the final element that must be met is the expenditure must be incurred between March 1st and November 15th. November 15th is the deadline for cities. That's the date that cities need to re, re turn funds, remaining funds, to their county. So although you'll see uh, a number of references to December 30th in much of the literature, as a city, your deadline is November 15th. Some of the things funds cannot be used for are revenue replacement. So for instance, property tax assistance is not an allowed use of CARES Act funds. Many cities offered reduced liquor license fees, for instance. So typically maybe they charged $2,000 for a liquor license and decided that because restaurants and bars had to be closed due to the stay at home order, that they would offer that license at a reduced fee of maybe $1,500. The $500 in lost revenue is not something that you can use CARES Act funding to replace. Uh, rentals is another area that um, Cities lose, you know, have, have lost revenue. Maybe they have a community center, a pavilion in the park, a campground, something like that, that needed to be closed and were not able to generate revenue from that source. You cannot use CARES funding for that. And another that we often hear from cities uh, is regarding utilities. If, if a city decided to forego late fees for March and April, for example, they cannot use CARES funds to replace that lost revenue. When you make a decision to spend your CARES fund, it's so important that you document how you came to that decision. As I said earlier, the rules around the CARES Act funding are changing constantly as we're getting a little bit better about defining the use and so forth. So when you make your decision to spend the CARES fund, be sure to document how you satisfied the three elements, how, how that expenditure is necessary, how it was not included in your budget, and that it was incurred between March 1st and November 15th. And be sure to have supporting documentation behind that, so an invoice, a timesheet, whatever, um, whatever you can do to substantiate that payment. And keep that in a file so that you're able to document how you spent your CARES dollars, and how you came to the conclusion that you've met the three elements. It's also a really good idea to prepare a resolution and ask that your council adopt that resolution. That way you've got clear documentation that that was well thought out, council agreed that that was an approved use. Rely on your city attorney and your city auditor to review and uh, you know, if, if you have questions and you're not quite sure if it's a qualified use, have a conversation with them up front and come to an agreement before you spend those funds. Uh, grants is a, an area that is approved to be a use for those CARES Act funds. So each city or municipality has to develop their own uh, criteria. And for cities in particular, 
the you still have to meet the state statute for spending funds or your city charter. So you still have to satisfy the public purpose test and you have to have the legal authority through either the statute or your city's charter to make that expenditure. And that's a difficult bar to reach because cities legally are not allowed to provide funds to small businesses. It's, it's difficult for a city to meet that public purpose test. So it's recommended that you use an EDA if your city has an economic development authority. The EDA is already set up with, uh, with the parameters in place to make a transaction to a local business. So an, another um, kind of a word of caution, look for a way to avoid duplication of the use of those funds. Work with the county so that you know that if the county already gave a business uh, some CARES Act funds, maybe you want to look to help another business and, and uh, be able to help as many as we can. Make sure you're checking with your city attorney when you're setting up the criteria for grants to make sure that they're in agreement that you've met your statutory obligations for appropriate expenditures. Grants to individuals are allowed as well. However, the grant needs to be necessary. So make sure you clearly define necessary so that you can quantify that and show that they've met the threshold. Um, another word about grants to small businesses, reimbursement for the cost of business interruption is an approved use and business interruption includes closures that are required but that uh, they had to close because of the stay at home order, the restaurants, the bars, that type of business, but also voluntary closures. So if a business decided to close because they were unable to accommodate social distancing or the demand for their business dropped off so significantly that they couldn't afford to stay open and that was due to the COVID pandemic, then those would both be an approved use of the, the funds. But remember, you still need to meet those three elements. It has to be necessary to address the current pandemic. It has to be something that is not included in the current budget of the city. And it needs to be an expense incurred from March 1st through November 15th. And governments have the discretion to determine what payments are necessary. Loans are something else that you can look to use your, uh, use your CARES Act funding for. Again, the three elements have to be met. It has to be necessary, unbudgeted, and incurred between March 1st and November 15th. Loan repayments that you receive before November 15th can be repurposed. You can loan those out again if you choose to, or you can use it to meet an expense that you have incurred as a city or a unit of government. But once November 15th comes for cities and, and that money is returned to the county, any loan payments received after November 15th need to be returned directly to the U.S. Treasury. When you structure uh, your grants and loans, remember that governments have the discretion to determine how to tailor that assistance and establish the programs, but make sure that it's in response to the COVID public health emergency. However, such a program should be structured in a manner as, as well as will ensure that such assistance is determined to be necessary. The word necessary is, uh, is emphasized quite frequently throughout the CARES Act. So it needs to be in response to the COVID pandemic and it needs to be necessary. And it also needs to satisfy the other requirements of the CARES Act and applicable law. Going back to the public purpose, you need to make sure that you're still abiding by state statute and making um, expenditures that we're allowed to make as units of government. An example of something that would not be allowed is a per capita payment to residents of a particular jurisdiction. So you can't say, you know, we're going to give everybody in our city $75 and spread this out so that everyone can share in the CARES Act. That's not an allowable expense. You have to have that the threshold of necessary. So they have, they have to prove uh, some sort of hardship and it has to be due to COVID. Uh, a word of caution. And this is directly from the U.S. Treasury's question and answer uh, section. And uh, so the question is, what happens if uh, an expense is determined to be an inappropriate use of CARES funding? Who's going to pay that back? And ultimately, the answer comes down to the unit of government that gave that money uh, in the grant, in a grant form, loan form, or as an inappropriate expenditure will have to pay that back. So make sure that you're watching those three elements specifically and making sure that they're legal expenditures because you don't want to have to pay that back down the road. 
there is a reporting requirement that comes with the CARES Act. And uh, so this will be taken care of by the Minnesota Management and Budget Division. The uh, website is listed on the slide and that is still a work in progress that's being developed. The uh, latest example of what we're expecting that expenditure report to look like is, is on your screen. This is in draft format and uh, there's a meeting coming up tomorrow where we're going to talk more about what exactly this form will look like. But what we know today is that it, it appears to be a very simple form. You'll enter the name of your um, local government, your SWIFT number, the person that's filling out the form, their phone number and, and email address, the total number of CARES dollars that you received and how much you've spent so far, and then the date that you're submitting it. So once you uh, fill out this report, it and have no remaining funds, you're all done. So if you receive your CARES Act funding and you've already got enough expenditures to use it all up, you fill it out once and you're done reporting. Uh, another reminder, and we talked about this earlier, is that November 15th date. That's the date that cities need to make sure that they've returned their CARES, remaining CARES Act funds to the county. So for cities um, who have councils that need to approve those claims, look at your calendar, find uh, the November 15th, and then back up to your next council meeting, and really that's your deadline, because you'll have to have that check prepared, approved, signed, and then to your county by November 15th. So it's gonna take a little bit of planning. So just a summary of what we've talked about today, in order to receive the CARES Act fund, you have to certify. So you're not gonna get them automatically. If you don't fill out that document, your city will not receive the funds. Be mindful of the three elements of an eligible cost. It has to be necessary due to the current pandemic. It has to be an unbudgeted item and the cost needs to be incurred between March 1st and November 15th. Report monthly to the MMB and then make sure you're returning uh, any leftover funds by November 15th to your home county. Um, just a, uh, something to let you know about, we have a webinar coming up offered by the League of Minnesota Cities on the 29th of July from 11 until noon. And the topic of that meeting will be the fund reporting requirements. So you're welcome to join us for that. You go to the League website to register for that. Um, and if you have any questions I can help you with, I'd be happy to address those now. Thank you so much, Lisa. So um, I would imagine there's probably a few questions. I'll just piggyback on that to say, um, as you all know, we did our first round of small business relief funds. We will be, be doing a second round of small business relief funds beginning at the end of July here. I think we were targeting July 27th. Uh, that, get might, that might get pushed out a few days. Uh, but the goal of that small business relief fund with CARES Act dollars was to target sole proprietors. We know that those uh, entities, the self-employed, the contract workers, the gig workers kind of were left out in the first round and through other grant programs as well. So we're broadening our reach in terms of our second program. We're also um, working with MCCD on that and they're doing a small business certification process that shows that the business can certify eligible use of the funds uh, to Lisa's point to target that the entity is not getting double funded for the same expenses through other means. Um, so what I, you know, I know I've had a couple communities reach out and wonder if they can kind of collaborate with the county on this and, you know, we don't need to get into a conversation about what that could look like, but I'll just invite you to shoot me an email after uh, if your community is interested in doing a small business relief program, there may be an opportunity for us to work together uh, to solicit applications so that we're not inundating our community with relief, you know, sprinkling of relief programs. Um, I'll just uh, note that we won't be able to kind of commingle the, these funds. We'll want to keep them separated. So there'll be some kind of compliance and oversight needed in this regard, but I just wanted to throw that out there as an opportunity. Um, so uh, looking through the chats here, if you want to put your question in the chat or raise your hand, actually we're on go to, so maybe there's a, a feel free to unmute yourself also to chime in, but uh, Janice uh, from Rosewell has a question. Uh, any chance the November 15th date could, date could be extended? Um, the deadline will be tough to get grants out, doable but tough, agreed. 
Um, we were under a short timeline with our December date, but the cities are under an even shorter timeline. Lisa, any conversations about extension of the deadline? Uh, we have not heard any conversation re regarding that. The December 30th deadline, of course, is the U.S. Treasury's deadline, and so they have to roll those funds back up. The city's returning funds to the counties, and then the counties to the state, and then the state to the federal government. So there's a number of steps, uh, in which makes you know the city is kind of the bottom of that pipeline. So we have not heard any any um, any news about that yet. But not to say that that won't be coming. You just you just never know. And Lisa, my question to you is um, for those counties, uh, Ramsey and Hennepin received our CARES Act allocation um, as a result of population size. Um, just confirming that um, I know that there was a nuance between the counties that re previously received CARES Act and those counties that didn't in terms of where the funds go. Um, it, is there some clarity on that? Because um, I know that there is conversation of, about it going to various hospitals. Yeah, there. When the CARES Act, are, I, the money is rolled back up. Um, I know Hennepin was one of the counties that their remaining funds will go to HCMC. Um, and, and any city has the ability to transfer their funds to their local hospital, public or private. Um, the smaller cities under populations under 200 will not certify and receive funds directly. They will sort of send their expenses to their county to be um, to receive any you know reimbursement um, does that answer your question yeah I think that's helpful yeah. okay so we've got about seven minutes here um, again if you have any qu specific questions for Lisa at this time feel free to unmute yourself or put it in the chat um, I'm just kind of curious I know, so Shoreview had their their small business relief program. So when we rolled out our first round, we had a note on the application form just kind of identifying all the various grant programs that an applicant could be eligible for. So we didn't double fund. Um, I'm kind of kind of interested in a um, let's see here, maybe in a show of chat for those communities that are interested in in allocating a portion of CARES Act dollars for small business relief or any sort of economic impact, rental assistance. Um, if you could say, if you could make a note in the, in the comment box, I think that would be kind of interesting. Um, I know reimbursement of expenses is going to be a big piece of uh, most communities' CARES Act allocation, but, um, but feel free to note that in there so we can get kind of a tally. And then um, Noah, I, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but um, is there a way that you could kind of give a, a various overview of the first round of funds to uh, kind of tell the communities as far as kind of where applications shook out across jurisdiction in that in that 861? Oh, I think you're on mute. Can you guys hear me? Oh. Is this better? Yes. All right. Um, just a second here. So in total, we had about 975 uh, applications submitted after we had vetted out a lot of the duplicates and a lot of the um, ineligible businesses uh, at the face value of what they showed us um, you know we got down to a much smaller number of 886 uh, number which is um, just kind of gathering my th thoughts right now um, from that we were able to eliminate a lot of um, businesses that was funded by the cities and just a second. Um, and so all together, you know, we had about a, uh, a good um, 
spread of uh, different uh, businesses uh, from all throughout um, the um, cities within Ramsey County. Uh, the bulk of the businesses having been from St. Paul, about 644. Um, and then from there, altogether, uh, the remaining suburbia, um, rural Ramsey County, uh, made up um, the difference. So 644 minus the 851 number. Um, so about 200 something. Um, and from there, a lot of the numbers are representative in the size of the local community. So, for instance, Roseville made up uh, about uh, 50 uh, businesses. White Bear Lake made about 50. Um, Maplewood was about 31 businesses. Uh, the demographics uh, regarding gender, uh, it was pretty uh, evenly split between ownership, uh, about uh, 44% um, uh Represented uh, was uh, said that they were female. Uh, Forty about fifty percent was male, and then the difference uh, there was just um, individuals who did not want to identify their um, uh, sexual orientation. Um, we had a large uh, number that, um, as far as a uh, ethnic background, um, about. 285 uh, was uh, identified as Black or Caucasian. Uh, the next highest um, minority group uh, was Asians, uh, with um, Black African Americans coming in uh, third, and then um, uh, Hispanics coming in um, thereafter. Um, so it's, it's a pretty widespread. As far as uh, where current things uh, stand today, uh, you know, we were able to get about $1.3 million out the door. Um, just a second here. Um, so we were able to get about $1.3 million out the door. Uh, we have about another $1.4 million left in uh, what's still in process. Um, and we're uh, still working through that. Uh, we're finding that from who applied, the percentages uh, and, and numbers are fairly um, close uh, to there. Uh, we, do, uh, we did notice that, uh, for instance, um, in the overall uh, application submittal, there was about 225 uh, Asian business owners who uh, applied, um, but in the approved status, about 93 uh, made it through. Uh, and so there's uh, some question as to you know, where where did the difference um, fall out? Um, and that's something that we'll be doing some um, uh, further checking uh, into uh, to kind of understand uh, more uh, and at a deeper level as to what's happening and, and what's causing the, the large um, difference from submittal to uh, getting it to approve. It could be a number of reasons as a result of um, language uh, barriers, it could be uh, issues with technology, uh, it could be issues with how the process uh, is, is, was set up and that with there being just a very uh, a lower barrier in the initial application that when we sent out the follow-up you know, request for the submission of, of uh, financial documents, then there it um, seemed a little bit cumbersome. And, and for some, they, uh, they just uh, did not um, want to continue to move forward. Uh, what we did find though is, is that we uh, had about a response rate of uh, 85% uh, from the overall group um, was uh, they were able to reach out to us and talk to us and let us know what their intentions are regarding how they want to move forward with the uh, grant op opportunity. Um, and of that uh, 85%, um, we were able to lower our denial rate um, and really truly have denial rates that are reflective of um, businesses that, you know, are not either eligible business types or businesses that was within the county. Um, and, and our denial rate right now is uh, currently sitting at uh, 10%, uh, whereas with the opportunity of this next round of uh, grant applications coming out, 
um, you know, we were able to kind of pre-approve and, and put them on a wait list uh, for that next uh, grant out, grant program there. Um, and so, so far, you know, we're we're currently sitting at about 44% uh, approved uh, right now uh, out of the entire pool. And we have about 18% uh, left where we have to kind of do cleanup and just waiting for follow-up from uh, a, a number of our applicants. Thanks, Noah. Appreciate that that overview. As you can see, it is, you know, to Janice's point, it's not so easy to uh, just kind of deploy these dollars. Uh, there's a lot of work that goes into it and, and it is labor intensive and we're very happy that MCCD has been our grant administrator on this process because Ramsey County otherwise wouldn't have the staff capacity to be able to do this. Um, so thank you to Noah and to Tyler who's on the call as well. Um, I want to thank Lisa. If there are any other questions for her, please, please chime in, um, jump in. But Lisa, thank you for uh, carving out half hour of your time today. We know you're very busy and um, giving us that overview. And I would imagine if there's questions that follow that Lisa would be happy to answer those via email uh, after today's summit. I'd be very happy to. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Good luck with your, the rest of your meeting. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. Um, so as we transition over, I wanted to give a little kind of context for what will be our next presentation. Uh, so we've got Joe uh, Minicosi from Urban3, uh, who will be joining us momentarily here. Oh, it looks like he's on the call. Welcome, Joe. He has quite a few slides, and I know he's going to kind of in, kind of go through them in rapid succession here. But um, uh, thank you, Joe, for, for joining us. I just want to uh, provide a little context as far as the fiscal health piece of our economic competitiveness and inclusion vision plan. Uh, so as you recall, we've talked a little bit about affordable housing, we've talked about transit-oriented development and workforce development and creative placemaking, and we've had a variety of engagement sessions soliciting feedback from our city partners and community on, on recommendations. And I want to stress that uh, now is a very transformative time. I hope, I hope we're all feeling that right now to take a look at our systems within our organizations and to say, how can we do things, not just better, but how can we do things differently to serve all of our residents with equity and understanding where Ramsey County sits in terms of a kind of local regional economy is important so that we can, you know, in, in a, actually in reality, benchmark ourselves against ourselves moving forward. Uh, that was the impetus for the vision plan and this fiscal health piece is an important piece to you know, consider where we channel resources moving forward and how we be more strategic in terms of redevelopment. Uh, so uh, this is a deeper dive that the Ramsey County Board did receive an overview, uh, a little piece of the fiscal health analysis uh, at a previous uh, board workshop. Uh, however, this is intended to do kind of a deeper dive into understanding um, land value, density, and a little bit of redlining too to understand the then and now. So without further ado, Joe, uh, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and we'll we'll get into it. Sure, thank you. Uh, my name is Joe Minicosi. I'm uh, the principal of Urban 3 based in Asheville, North Carolina. And um, we're basically a geospatial uh, economics firm, but what we really do is, is, is handle a lot of data and find a way to communicate it uh, visually for folks. Uh, my background is I'm, I'm trained actually as an architect and um, and I have a graduate degree in urban design with a concentration in real estate development. Um, though I've spent most of my time in the private sector in real estate development, real estate finance, uh, town planning. Um, I've also spent uh, five years working in municipal government. And one of the things that was kind of an having having been on both sides of the fence of the private and somebody's somebody's not on mute here. Um, but let's see, I, I can mute everybody from here, I think. <laughs> um, one of the things that, uh, that what I've kind of noticed, and, and I was guilty of this when I worked in government, is I, I didn't really understand, like if there was finance or anything talking about cash flow, I was like out of the picture. It was like, okay, that's the finance officer, 
I don't have to deal with that. I have some serious zoning work to do. Um, and I, I basically remove myself because of the complexity of government out of processes to understand how they're connected. So what we try to do is, is make a macro model so that you can see the big picture. Um, and what we're known for is uh, is is uh, data, uh, basically data storytelling uh, of of what's what your data is. Now, as as a city planner and as somebody who's worked in cities, um, I try to put my lessons up front, and I'll give you my simplest lesson. If you want to think of Ramsey County or any municipality inside Ramsey County, um, you, and even St. Paul, just think of where you are in a place and time. So the easiest way to refer to it is is a form of DNA. So if you want to see my DNA of how I started my life, this is what I was when I was three months old, and this is my trajectory. So I'm going to be my grandfather whether I like it or not. There's not a lot I can do to change that path. Or more importantly, um, I'm going to be this guy. Now, you know, both pictures, I actually had more hair than I have now. But but there's you know there's a path that I'm on to be my parents and then my grandparents. There's a growth plan DNA that I have that I can't change. So all places have that. And so a lot of this is really a, a struggle to understand the DNA, the choices and policies that were put down decades before you to understand how that's growing your community and what you're struggling with. So we have a genetic predisposition in our family to heart disease. My dad had a seven bypass heart surgery. I don't know what you call that, a septuple. You know, but but I'm also Italian, and I like to eat pizza, and I eat food that's really bad for me. But I know that I have this DNA that I have to exercise. I have to watch how much pizza I eat, stuff like that. So so just simply put, who's Ramsey County's grandparents? You know, what what, what municipality inside your community? You know, White Bear Lake. What's 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 its grandparent? What does it want to be when it grows up? Because it's got DNA in it. So a quick little story about Asheville, where we're based right now. This is Asheville from the 1990s. This isn't too long ago. Asheville was essentially mothballed, and we just boarded up our downtown and walked away. And there was a culture in our community that was basically adverse to the, the downtown. There was just, you know, we're not urban people. We're rural people out here in the mountains. We don't care about those buildings. And we essentially walked away from this stuff. Now, our parent company is a group called Public Interest Projects that was started by this guy, Julian Price. He essentially inherited um, $15 million and put it into a real estate development company. And with that, what we did is we basically put, we, we invested in businesses and buildings, 75% into fixing buildings and 25% of the cash flow into uh, businesses. Now our time was a direct opposite. So we're helping businesses in the ground floor, but we're mostly taking buildings like this and fixing it up. Um, so that building was just hiding behind that that steel mask and we just basically said well you know we can turn this into apartments there's surely some people want to live downtown and it was making people come downtown and by putting them there that's which is basically straight up jane jacobs kind of stuff but it's in the in the scale of human history we've always had these these residents that are in the downtown it may not be all of us but there's a portion of our community that wanted that and this was a no-brainer to us what we found is that people weren't talking about data they were just talking about how they felt or what they wanted or what their perspective was rather than realizing we're a community of 90,000 people. Surely there's 26 people that want to live in an apartment downtown. I mean, it was a no brainer for us, but for the community, they're operating with biases, and not with data. And it was really kind of mind blowing to not see what we were creating. So we had to explain it to people we're like, look, here's the, here's the value of our downtown. So if we're a $15 million investor, our downtown was worth $100 million back in 1991 just by fixing up all of those buildings. We didn't get a new building in downtown Asheville till 2008. So these are all the buildings that were just sitting there. This is the untapped value, basically $400 million worth of opportunity, or another way of looking at it, the county got four times more taxes off the assets that were sitting there. And they didn't have to do anything. The, the city got punched in the face for fixing the streets and sidewalks. These are, these are some campaign ads. I love these campaign ads from Chris Peterson in the 1990s. And perhaps you all have some people like this. Here they are complaining about $26 million of public investment. So the government steps in and says, all right, it's a, you know, we need to make some parking, fix some sidewalks, you know, put up, plant some trees, basically enhance the urban environment. And this guy's complaining about $26 million. I like this downtown development for bureaucrats instead of water sewer streets for our citizens. Y'all got people like that? You know, just don't take my tax dollars. It's like, well, hold on a second. Um, 
you invested $26 million and the value of that commodity grew by 430. Is investing 26 and yielding $430 million, is that a good return on investment? Yeah. So why do we listen to Chris? You know, it's like Chris is entitled to his opinion. He's not entitled to facts. So we need to put that out there so that they can see that. This is my community grew wealth. Now, it was us that built it. We built the buildings and fixed the buildings and invested. But it, but we did that happily to get more wealth for our community. And, and you know, you're not going to stop Chris. He's got a website with fire and brimstone and all of this stuff. I like that the lightning bolt's hitting the mayor in the head. He misspelled charlatans. Um, I asked the mayor, I'm like, is that a liquor drink? She goes, yeah, it should be. You know, this is, everybody's got people like Chris. And what it is, is we've lost this ability to have a civic conversation about community. So this is a kid's book from 1959. The city, the town, and the country. It's a teacher's guide. They used to teach us in grade school. This is a third grade textbook from 1959. So in kindergarten, you learn about your house. First grade, the school. Second grade, the neighborhood. Third grade, you learn about regional planning. Do you all do that? Um, I love this book. In the teacher's guide, right? So you're a teacher. This In the first half of the book, it tells you how to deal with your kids. Um, you know, Commissioner, I, I hope this isn't too much PTSD for you, but in the, in the book, it says this. Um, while counties, while patterns vary from state to state, counties are responsible for education, library, health and welfare, uh, agriculture, conservation, et cetera. In studying the functions performed by your county, you will no doubt find there's a duplication of services and overlapping of jurisdictions and a lack of coordination between the county and the communities within it. Y'all have that problem? It, you know, in the book, it's one of these Dick and Jane books. So it's got these, you know, you recognize the graphics. It's, it's painfully white. It's also somewhat misogynistic. The girls are all shoved out in the hallway for some reason. But you read about a new factory that gets built. There's even more kids that go to school. And so in blue, this is what you ask your third graders, third graders, right? Give four good reasons for building a new school. And your third graders talk about what? Equity, everybody should have a desk, you know? Maybe get another teacher, split the class in two. That's called infrastructure. On the right, you read about Mr. Canfield. He didn't want a new school. He says, our taxes are too high now. If we build a new school, we'll need more teachers and everything else. We'll have to pay still our higher taxes. That is indeed true. So you ask your third graders up here in blue, why would some people have to pay higher taxes and why are some people against paying higher taxes? So here on two pages, we get the duality of the cost of government and the consequences and need of government. And these third graders figure it out and realize that they need to make community investments, right? It's like, yeah, of course people don't wanna pay taxes. You know, there's this great colonial barb don't tax me, don't tax thee, tax the fellow behind the tree. We're a country of tax evaders. We threw tea in the, in the harbor to, to not pay taxes. Let's just own that, all right? But the favorite part is that my, of the book is this. Remember too that many children, whether urban and rural and regardless of region, are tragically limited in their knowledge of their world and their world's a space in which they live and operate. So if I can't get to my job or drop my kid off at school, all of a sudden it's, it's, it's the commission's fault. You need to build me a parking space or you need to do something for me. It's like, okay, there's a lot more people than you, but somehow we let that process steer how we make decisions. So if we step out of this for a second, and in the case of Asheville, um, you know, I'm thinking that my city is just one really big real estate development project that has a finite boundary of land. My state has removed the ability for my city. We're the only city in North Carolina that's not allowed to annex land. That's how much my state loves us. Um, so that land that we have are all the acres we got. Now for a county, that's doubly true. You can't, Ramsey County can't annex Hennepin County. Like all that you have is what you have. You might want to, but, but you can't, right? Um, so if you think about this, we're an incorporated real estate development company, but so is my city. And by law, actually, if you look up in Oxford American Dictionary, incorporate to constitute a company, a city, or other organization as a legal corporation. So my city of Asheville is incorporated, my county is incorporated, so is yours. Your state, my state are incorporated and so is our federal government. Joe Biden said this on the Stephen Colbert show, the United States is the largest corporation in the world. I'm such a nerd at midnight, I'm looking it up. There's the US code if you wanna see it. We are a federal corporation. So my city at $14 billion of taxable value is six times the value of Ted Turner. Now, does Ted Turner just wake up every day and just look at Facebook and just hear who's complaining and just kind of make his political decision, his decisions off that? Of course not. He's looking at data and seeing stuff. So, so my community, we should be doing the same. So 
if you think of, if you ever talk to a farmer, farmers are always talking about in economic terms, the crop yield per acre, the water per acre, labor per acre, all of that stuff. It's always a cash flow before they farm and their farm is finite. So if we did the same thing in our city, this is one of the buildings that we rehabbed. So we did the uh, retail office and residential. This was an old JCPenney's department store that we converted to a mixed use building. We did it because the city invested in the streetscape. So thank you city for the garbage can, the bike rack, two benches and a street tree. So the city committed to that. That's what Chris got pissed off about. So, okay, fine. Chris, you're right. That's a subsidy at our front door. Got it. We took the taxable value from $300,000 to $11 million. So the community got a 3,500% increase on taxes. So do you have a 401k plan that grows by 3,500%? Wouldn't you like that? So that's not just city taxes. The county's taxes went up that high too, right? So, hey, county, how about a thank you card? And, and you know, what we got back from people like, well, Joe, that's $11 million. We got this Walmart at 20. Sure, okay, it's, it's more. But it also took 34 acres of my corporation to make that happen versus our 0.2 acres. So you just burn through 34 acres of the farm to make that value. So on a tax productivity level, the taxes per acre, we're crushing it versus them. We're producing 100 times more taxes than that thing is. So why are you looking at the gross number? We're, we're doing double the retail sales. Now, who would have thought that a, a furniture store, a tattoo shop, and a beauty salon are producing double the retail sales per square foot, per acre, per whatever, than a Walmart? We've also got residents. They don't have any. And we also have a lot more jobs. So if we're we're not doing the numbers in an apples to apples way. We're not understanding what's really happening. And this is all that we ask is that, could you do this stuff? And we did, we did this for you. So thank you for, for help uh, having us do this. We're trying to just baseline the conversation and deal with people's biases. And you know, some people are just like, Joe, you just hate Walmart. Um, just quick little interesting side story. Um, I presented at the International Association of Tax Assessing Officers. I don't know if y'all hang out with your tax assessor, um, but a tax assessor's conference makes a planning conference feel like Burning Man. It was like the squarest conference I've ever been to. It was hilarious. I mean, these people are massive nerds and they're, they're awesome. But this guy got up and presented at eight in the morning and showed spreadsheet after spreadsheet on how cheap Walmarts are. I'm in the back of the room watching this going, this is brilliant. This guy's getting all of his property taxes lowered in one meeting. There's 3000 assessors and they're all discounting his property because he's explaining how cheap the buildings are. Don't hate the player, hate the game, right? I, who, who would, that's efficient. Now, I was having a heart attack because I'm like, how is he getting away with this? Why does no one care? Well, assessors are agnostic. If it's low value, it's low value. They can't make value. So I went up to the microphone and I asked him, I said, Mr. Terrell, what's the useful life of one of your buildings? And he shot back at me, 15 years, maybe 20. We designed the building to depreciate it as fast as possible. So we start to pay lower taxes. And we're, we care more about the distribution system of the, of the, of the building and, and our network. The buildings are insignificant. We want to depreciate them as fast as possible to maximize the depreciation and build another building and depreciate it again. We don't care about the buildings. So I tell every, I'll tell, I'm telling you all, I tell every community, I'm like, just be aware that that's the way our system works. That when you build a tax system based on value, there's a perverse incentive to build junk in your community. Or just consciously go into your relationship as a corporation with their corporation and that their commitment to you is 15 to 20 years. That's it, which is the life cycle of a cat. That's all you get out of it. If you're okay with that, awesome. You know, but we at least more in the passing of the cat. I, I'm, I'm going through a lot of this stuff just to kind of normalize information, making some jokes, but this isn't complex math that I'm doing here. What I'm showing you all is how we value things and how we rate things. And the, and the easiest way to think about it is think of cars. When we talk about cars, we don't talk about it on a miles per tank basis, do we? Could y'all imagine if we're having coffee this morning and, and I'm like, hey, my truck gets 650 miles per tank. Like, what would you say to me? You're like, Joe, it's got a big tank. That's stupid. We do it on a miles per gallon. All tanks are different sizes, right? So when we say miles per gallon, oh, look at that, the numbers just changed and we should all be driving BMW Assettas. So sometimes we let our biases get in the way or habits, I should say, of how we've always done things rather than look at, is there a different way to ask questions to understand what's going on? So we've done this all across the country. We've actually done it over in uh, Northfield, Minnesota and uh, Minneapolis. And we'll bring in some of those examples.
but but we really see a simple trend that for every dollar of of county taxes somebody in single family is paying to the county their brother and sister in the city and single family is paying about five times that to that same county here's the walmart here's the mall that's a two-story building this is a three-story building and that's a six-story building so what you find is that when you stack stories it's not it's not a it's not a proportional growth it's an exponential growth upward and that's the phenomenon of basically building more valuable buildings um just kind of skip ahead here so the mapping side of it um here's a here's a way to look at it this is this is my county this is Buncombe county um by the way if you ever heard the term you don't know bunk uh that's due to my county um, and our state legislator. So uh, there's a great story behind that. Um, but anyway, uh, this, is the, this is a map of valuation of my county. So we have non-taxable, this is Mount Mitchell State Park, our federal park, and this is Mount Pisgah. So the two tallest mountains east of the Mississippi are federal land, part of the Blue Ridge Parkway, and it's non-taxable. So just to be crude about it, I don't care about it, doesn't pay me taxes, right? That's what we hear sometimes from folks here around here. Um, I've got low value in green, and I've got high value in purple. This is the Biltmore Estate. That's America's largest house. That one house is worth $100 million, one house. But it's really not a fair way of looking at it because that house is also 180,000 square feet, and it takes 8,000 acres of land to make it happen. So rather than total value, let's do value per acre. Now we get a different, again, different question, different map. Here it is in 3D. Can you all tell me where downtown Asheville is? You know, boom, you can see it right there. Now, what's interesting is this is our little cousin, Black Mountain. That's a village of about 12,000 people. You could see its mountain popping up too. That's just two and three story buildings doing that little mountain. So they have their epicenter in their ring. We have our epicenter in our ring. Now for folks that live out in the county, um, now mind you, we don't have a great relationship with our county here. Uh, our state our state legislator, I was on the board for the Asheville Downtown Association when our state legislator called us a cesspool of sin, which is super awesome. And, you know, we're polite Southerners. We're like, really, do you think he really meant it? And um, so we sent a reporter to go talk to him and he doubled down and said, it's not it's not the good people of Buncombe County. It's just that downtown part. That's where the freaks and weirdos are. That's the cesspool. And we're just like, really? Um, we're producing all the wealth. Think about this, we're all paying six mils to the county across this model. So think of a six mil thick blanket across this model. Where's the county getting all of its money? Here. But what happens is folks only understand their relative position. So people out here in Fairview, in defense of them, they honestly don't know what we're paying downtown. So they know their tax bill. They might know their cousins who live further out. And when they look at their tax bill, we're like, oh, we're doing double than them. Got it but they have no idea. So we need to communicate that and realize that we're all in this together. I'm a county taxpayer, let's work together. So that's the thesis of where we're going into your project. How do we visualize this stuff? How do we do Ramsey County? You know, obviously we're dealing with St. Paul as well. So we're it's a very large city. We'll try to break those apart, but first we have to go through the tax system. Every time we go into a community, uh, particularly a new state, we have to understand your tax system and how it works. And then what we're trying to do is explain it back. So this is the way North Carolina works. We get a, a market value. We get a, an assessment ratio that a state sets. And that's straight across the board for everybody. So we all get the same haircut. And that's our taxable value. And then locally, we set up our millage rate. And that's it. It's called a straight line system. It's probably one of the simplest tax systems that we've ever seen. Y'all are Minnesotans. You're like rock stars compared to where we're at. Um, you think about data differently than we do. Um, you have, I, I call it like the waterfall effect. You have uh, homestead reductions. There's other reductions that you uh, you you put you you have a community value on if you're handicapped. Um, there's there's other discounts. There's numerous discounts that you all have. Once you subtract all of those, you get your taxable value. Um, then you t apply a class rate to how much of a portion of that are we taxing? That's your tax capacity. So you don't tax the full value, you're taxing a piece of it. Well, that means your millage rate's a lot higher. Some of you might that, that know your county millage rate, when you heard me say I'm six mils, and you realize you're like maybe 10 times that, well, it's because you're taxing less of your property. It's just a decimal point moving around. So that's your tax capacity. You times your local, your local rate to get your tax bill. 
So when you bore into that, you can start to find how you're adjusting those numbers. So for commercial properties, let's just use this as an example, $100,000 of market value for commercial or residential. Now for those two classes, you're gonna be taxing, your, your tax value and your market value is basically the same thing. Um, now you exclude out because you're a homestead, you're like, okay, we're taking $28,000 off that. So for when you talk to your citizens, realize when they say I'm paying a lot of taxes, it's like, yeah, you're paying a lot, but not as much as the commercial properties, you know, just, just so you know. Um, so then you get uh, uh, another, uh, there's other deductions baked into it, but basically the second deduction you're getting is the tax capacity. So notice that the ratios are different. So you're basically paying one and a half times more as a commercial property on a higher value. Does that make sense? Um, so uh, now there, that does get split in residential, that if it's over a certain value, you're paying a higher class rate if you're over 500,000. And on commercial, if it's over um, 150,000, um, you're paying a higher class rate. But stripping that aside, this is basically the tax capacity numbers that you're talking about now. So you're basically, oops, was that two times? Now we're up to two times the, the, the rate for commercial versus residential. Um, the, 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 the class, the, the tax rate may be the same um, for, the, for the city, the school, or the county and other rates combined. Um, and then the state, you charge a, a property tax through the state system as well, or a piece of it. Uh, but basically your overall uh, tax, tax rate is, is 220 versus R6, if you, if you think of it that way. But here's your tax bill for that $100,000. Um, and you'll notice that the commercial property is two times more. So even though we had a same starting position, the ending position gets distorted through all of those waterfalls. Does that make sense? So we have to go through when we do your model and we have to normalize all that stuff. So when we do the tax picture, the citizen understands that here's how you all are reflected. And you'll see the commercial properties pop up. Um, oh, by the way, the effective tax rate on those properties um, would be like a 3% tax rate for commercial uh, in that, that class and a 1.6 rate for the commercial. This is a different way of explaining that. So uh, your, this is your county from a total value standpoint, so the miles per tank standpoint, and you see all these massive parcels are super, super valuable. Well, it's because they're super, super big. Um, so rather than total value, this is value per acre. Now you start to see the heat in, in downtown St. Paul, and here you are in 3D. Um, we'll go through this several times, but um, basically you can see the effect of St. Paul. Now remember, everybody's paying that same millage rate across the county. This is showing you how that's being produced. Um, now this isn't to say like everybody needs to move in a, in a, into downtown St. Paul, but it behooves the, the county to understand that value effect of whatever they're doing in St. Paul because it's going to affect you. Um, conversely, there's some things you can you can learn and steal from them that they've been able to achieve that are replicable um, outside outside in the in the remaining county, and we'll go through that as well. So here's St. Paul total value and value per acre, um, and then just St. Paul's model, and then just going into the downtown, um, a lot of non-taxable in the downtown, which you all know. Um, but um, and then here's the total value. Here's downtown by itself. So speaking of non-taxable, your county is at, at uh, about 34% tax exempt. So that's just stuff that's not, you know, it could be a lake, a college, or whatever. Um, that's actually not that high for a county that has so many colleges that you all have. Um, so we, we were expecting something higher than that. Uh, St. Paul itself is at about 36%. Just to tell you, like, that's the same as Asheville, and we don't have nearly the colleges that St. Paul has and a state capital. So it's actually pretty good. Um, I mean, it's just, I mean, you know, there's, it's just, there's a ridiculous amount of, of campuses that you all have, which is actually a benefit. You're essentially importing residents um, that you could generate into future Saint, uh, future uh, Ramsey County residents out of that. You're essentially bringing students in. Um, when you look at downtown, this is where the number changes. It gets up to about 52% non-taxable. Um, that's on the high side, um, but you are a state capital. Um, so just to look at the model and to look at the side view, like a, like a mountain profile of St. Paul, you can see the potency that comes out of downtown. And if we were to talk to St. Paul, we would recommend 
you know, thickening up in here. You can see these gaps and they really should be more of a mountain with some foothills uh, rather than just these kind of spikes that pop up out of nowhere. But again, that's something they can work on. And, and maybe that's a conversation y'all could have with them because when they grow that wealth, that also grows county wealth as well. Um, so it's worth the investment. Um, when you strip out St. Paul, um, this is just looking at the different cities that are out there. Um, one of the things that we're looking for, back to that Asheville example, is who's your Black Mountain? Where, where are those other little downtowns that are out there? And I think this is an opportunity for you all. It's, it just, it's, a lot of the communities just never built them. Um, they suburbanized post-war and it was more of um, separating uses and not really creating that traditional um, city. Now you can see over in White, in White Bear, they actually do have a little mountain going on over here, um, which is kind of rare for the, all of the all of the different cities. So that's a lesson that could be applied. You know, everybody should grow their own uh, little little downtown, if you will. Um, when you look at the city as a as a shareholder of the county, your uh, St. Paul takes up about half uh, the or, or about half the county's value. Uh, it's only taking up 31% of the county's uh, area. So from a ratio of potency of how much footprint do you have versus how much punch do you have in the in the in the revenue stream, that's a one to let's call it a one to two ratio of productivity. So pound for pound it's double the potency to your to your county, which is good. Um, not not the strongest we've seen, but it's it's good. And now again because you have a lot of value spread into your county. Um, when you look at the downtown in St. Paul, um, the downtown takes up, uh, it's about 9% 9, 9 of the value, it's about 2% of the area. That's a one to five ratio of productivity. So downtown's doing great for the city of St. Paul, um, but it's also doing great for you. When you look at the downtown to the county, um, you're looking at a one to nine ratio of productivity. Um, that's quite high uh, for, the, for the county, for a county the size of your population and area. Um, that's pretty good. So pound for pound, dollar for dollar, whatever happens in the downtown is great for the city, but it's incredible for the county. Um, you know, so that, that kind of cooperation uh, is necessary to continue. So now as we've gone from the, the mapping, let's check, look at some of your ingredients that make up your community. Um, and you are uh, the, the, the Minneapolis, St. Paul area. So we grabbed all of your targets uh, because they're your people. Um, but your targets are pulling an average value of about a million dollars, uh, 1.1 million per acre. So that's their mile per gallon or their tax production. I'm going to use that as the control subject as we look at all other building types. We'll use this as the benchmark. Um, we call this the Big Mac index that McDonald's checks the, the value effect of all of the economies across the world based off the price of a Big Mac. So we can do that with, with this. So let's just use that, that as the control subject. And let's start with residential. Out in the county, uh, your uh, your single family is about, let's say, nine hundred thousand um, dollars, or about eighty percent the value of a target uh, for single family. When you get into the city, it's amazing. It jumps up to about one point five million, um, which is kind of kind of insane. And Will Creasy, our our, our analyst on the project, pointed out that. You know, if you all ask why, we know why. It's it's the average lot size is 0.16 acres in the city. The value is going to be higher, but also the area, it's more efficient on an area. When you look out, it's almost double that when you get out in the county. And people may say, Joe, look, I want to be, I want to have more land. I want to stretch out. It's like, okay, great. But it's going to take away value from the municipality, from the government, from you all to stretch out. And you also pick up more frontage of road in the process, which means more um, cost of delivery of service. So just be aware of that. When people ask for things, you need to understand like what's the cost effect to the community. I want, I want to be six foot tall and have a full head of hair. I think you should pay for that. Great. Well, what's the cost of that? So, so when you look at multifamily, now you're up to 1.2 million, 2 million, 6 million. So when people say multifamily is bad, realize that's a bias. Um, you know, oftentimes when I'm in front of an audience and they say something like that, I ask for a show of hands from the audience of who has never lived in a multifamily building. 
just to, you know, tell people like we've all been in that position at one point in time in our lives, you, you know, recently graduated, recently divorced, new to town. And it's, it's, a, it's a useful product, but it's also incredibly valuable from a, from a taxable standpoint. And, and realize that of your, uh, of your county, you're looking at 40% of your land area is already single family. That's a lot of your land that you've grown that low value crop on. And it's not to say that it's not desirable. I, I get that. It's just understand the value exchange for giving away that commodity. And that land is all the land that you have. When you talk multifamily, you're at 1.8, you're at 2 million now. And remember, single family was at 900,000. So this is double the value of single family. When you get into uh, St. Paul, you can start to find other examples of, of ways to blend uh, single family or multifamily into the, 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 the region. And you're looking at multifamily inside St. Paul is now another 800,000 or 900,000 on top of that. Now they're pushing 3 million an acre when you get into, into St. Paul. And I, and I don't know if you all have had discussions about the missing middle um, but we did this graphic, uh, Dan Paralek from Opticos is, is sort of famous for pointing out that we used to build this way. We used to have this middle ingredient in cities, uh, that it wasn't just about multifamily, big buildings and mid-rises and single family, that there's a whole alphabet of, of typologies that you can find all over. Actually, St. Paul actually has a good examples of these. But when you look at the potency effect of this stuff, um, you know, th this is, we're talking, 2 million, 4 million, this one's 10 million an acre. Like, is, is this undesirable? I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a quite beautiful building, yet we've somehow forgotten how to do this stuff. And in some cases it's illegal from a zoning perspective. So don't, don't miss these opportunities to find these ingredients and just say, when we talk multifamily, we're, we're talking this, like who would, who would argue to have that addition to their neighborhood? I mean, I'm sure somebody would, but, but $10 million, that's pretty good. So that's about, let's call it 12 times to 13 times the potency of single family residential for that building typology. Um, St. Paul is actually doing some interesting stuff um, uh, over in the, um, the Winnipeg, on Winnipeg Ave. This building right here is an old building pulling about 3.7 to well, closer to four. Um, this one's pulling 7.6. These are new buildings that were built along a transit line. Um, so anything, anything. If St. Paul is going to be doing more of this stuff on their transit lines, this should be encouraged uh, because that's an incredible value potency jump. This building is basically the same height, but it's double the value uh, uh, potency. Um, and what's what's interesting is this is just ripping off an old lesson from like 100 years ago. We used to do this stuff, and it was common sense, but we've somehow forgotten that. So um, back to the commercial types. Now those are all the residential mixed stuff. Uh, your Walmart's a lot less value than your target. Uh, let's call it under a, under a million. And again, the target's down here on the lower right. When you get into your malls, uh, 600,000. So the, the Home Depot is less value than single family. You know, just put it that way. Um, this, this shopping center is a million. Uh, White Bear is 900,000. Uh, when you get into your malls, your Maplewood Mall is not doing so well. It's like a, a 1.3 million. Um, this one's 2.5 million. This typology of development has a limited shelf life. It wasn't designed to last forever. It's not. It's not intent. It's just a cash flow model at the expense of municipalities. And when people say they want it, it's because we've baked into the system an easier path for that to happen, if you will. It's, it's easier from a zoning perspective and it's easier to finance because it's extracting its money out as fast as possible. When you look at some old models, I mean, this is a mall. So this is a mall that y'all have been living with. It's built in 1922. It's almost 100 years old. And when markets change, this thing didn't like have to be scraped down because no one knows how to use it. It didn't turn into a church. You know, it's it's like, it's 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 iterated, you know. I'm sure this I'm sure this wasn't for the last hundred years empower yoga, you know. So it's had different businesses circulating through it, and the typology could handle that. So this is a lesson right in your own community that this mall is close to 10 million an acre, and Maplewood Mall is only 1.3 million. Does that make sense? Um, just across the street on Winnipeg, I mean, we'll just grab some some vacant buildings that have vacancy that are mixed use 
uh, just to show the potency of that architectural typology. So the Plan B lounge that's empty uh, uh, upstairs is pulling 4 million an acre. Uh, this building here is pulling 4.7 million an acre. Um, and then you have these odd lots that, you know, just lots of times people say, well, it's not a useful lot, it's odd or whatever. It's like, here's a bunch. Um, look at the day by day cafe. This is a weird little triangular parcel and it's pulling 6 million an acre. Um, this one's 4 million. This one's 9 million an acre. This is again another missing middle. This is, we call these uh, uh, six packs. It's uh, basically uh, two apartments per floor, three stories tall, a highly efficient multifamily product. Um, so that's at 10 million. When you get into your 3M campus, it drops down to about 400,000. Um, center point office parks, 1.4 million. Uh, the data sciences is, is 2 million. Now this isn't fair to be pointing at the 3M campus this way because a lot of it is industrial scale buildings, but it's also the way in time at which this was planted out. Um, it, it's, it's basically a huge land consumer with massive surface parking lots. So it basically dissipates all of its value over a large area. And that's a, that's a sign of the times. That was a very modern way of looking at it post-war was that we'll, didn't even think about the financial side of it. They were just building buildings and, and making it easy for people to drive around. But, but think about the scale effect of when you consume, again, your limited farm. We just dropped a target. Uh, you know, Will grabbed a football field just to put it in there, just so you could see that a target is about four football fields of area. Uh, by comparison, these are other boxes of commercial. Uh, your Walgreens, Cubs Foods, uh, we grabbed the Coney Island, Shelburne Jewelers and White Bear Lake and Mischief Toys. Um, now, when you look at the value difference, Miss, Mischief Toys is 7 million an acre, which is about seven times the pot or six times the potency of, of, the, of, the, of the target. So six times the potency and you could fit how many of these Mischief Toys in, in that footprint? So again, think of your crops and how you use your land and how to find ways to incentivize or equal the playing field to get that higher potency stuff that, you know, when Mischief Toys goes out of business, it just changes into another business. It doesn't have to be scraped down to nothing. Um, so speaking of which, it, your history. Um, there's lots of lessons in the architecture of, of place and you can find going in deeper into the downtown. Uh, we just grabbed a smattering of buildings for your top 10 producers in the county. Um, coming in at number 10 is the Gallery Tower, and then we have uh, Sibley Square, um, Jackson's Tower, and then the Lowry. Um, it's interesting that Jackson Tower, which is a taller building, is actually less productive than the Lowry um, over here. When you get into the number six is the Great Northern, which is again a shorter building than the tower. Um, you've got these two towers here in City Walk in the point, and then uh, Lawson Commons, the uh, Commerce Building, and the Minnesota Building. The Minnesota Building is coming in at $64 million an acre of value, and it's shorter than the Lawson Commons, and it's also older. So just, you know, again, it's don't let your eyes tell you what's happening. Look at the data and, and see what the data tells you what's happening. And also understand the value of these old buildings, like particularly your oldest building in your community. Um, your, your, the original Coney Island Tavern, which was built in 1858, so you know that's well over 100 years old, um, is still pulling 3.4 million dollars an acre, and the 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 newer uh, original Coney Island uh, building is pulling 3.6. Um, so that's that's a lesson of the buildings. I'm not going to go through this whole bar chart, but this is basically looking at all those previous slides. And turning them into uh, so you have a chart of how they look, and and just so you can see how they stack up, blue is residential, red is commercial, green is mixed use, and you can see see when you start to mix your uses, it starts to elevate and and pump up in value, and you can see what single you know in some cases county single family is doing better than your downtown Sears, the Home Depot, and the 3M campus, um, but it's not doing better than uh, four unit Prod, uh, house on Thomas at 486 Thomas is 3 million an acre versus single family at 900,000. Um, and when you get into mixed use buildings like the uh, 
the the river garden yoga building is pulling four million and then of course when you get into the downtown it's stunning how much potency that is so if you were to just look at your taxes off these properties the bar chart would look exactly the same the numbers would be different but it's basically the same kind of flow of value so you know i'll just run through some examples nine acres of the uh, west mall is equal to the 68 acre maplewood mall so do you want to use nine acres or do you want to use 68 acres it's going to come out to the same value by these building types but you've consumed so much more of your real estate which means you get so much more infrastructure uh, demand uh, cost of roads cost of pipes goes up when you stretch the property out um, three quarters of an acre of the building on the right would equal the 13 acre home depot you know not even an acre of that building um, this is the St. Paul Hotel. Uh, basically, this is the way that it would look um, from a value comparison. You'd need this much of the St. Paul property to equal that much of the Country Inn Suite property. Um, so you'd actually need you'd need less of that acreage, about half of the building's footprint, to equal all of that. Um, this is you know, we really love this building, um, the Sibley Square building. I'm missing it's. it's it's just a simple box, but it's pretty and it's it's potent. Uh, less than half an acre of that. So basically, this much of the building, if you took a third of that building, it would equal all of that. Um, this office building downtown compared to those office buildings, you only need three acres of the Lawson to equal the 400 acre uh, campus. So basically you'd need three of the Lawson buildings to equal all of that uh, from a land. Actually, sorry. Uh, 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 all of that. Um, this guy, I don't even know if you know this building, the 496 Thomas building. We just grabbed this one because it was quirky. Um, that it's it's not even well well it's well loved, let's say. Um, but it's if you had two and a half of those buildings, it would equal all of the Home Depot. Um, so uh, part of what we did with talking with Martha was basically come up with a, a way of can you can you come up with a standard of um, you know think about when you go to the doctor you're going to get your blood pressure your uh, your height your weight to develop a body mass index what are the key indicators that you can look at all of the different cities and give this information to all of the cities so that they can have a comparative peer sample oh, they're all cousins basically in the same family um, so one of the, one of the things that we pull is you know the simple things that we recommend to check are your total valuation. So Maplewood's worth four billion dollars. Billion. Um, it's about four square miles, four and a half square miles. Their population of thirty-eight thousand. Their peak value per acre. Their top of their model is at eight million. Their average value per acre is is four thirty-five. So as a relative sample, they're all around the same metro complex. So they should all at least have some comparative indicators to look at each other against. Um, so when you look at their top. Uh, property it's the uh, it's an assisted living building actually is the most potent building at 8 million an acre um, and then here's Cardinal Point and just by relative comparison you can see this is we pointed out that's the mall at 1 million so you know simply put the the, the assisted living facility is about you know let's say seven six or seven times the potency of the mall um, Concordia Arms Apartments is like Two and 2.8 times the mall. Um, Shoreview, here are their indicators 3.4 billion, 12 square miles, uh, 25,000 people, 5.2 million. This is 540,000. So this is uh, now we're going up the chain. So we're going from 400,000 um, to 500,000. Um, and its top indicator is the, again, another senior living. Uh, one of the things that we found with a lot of this is that those are the big breadwinners in those communities because they're the most dense. They have uh, less parking than most. Um, so there's a lesson there. Um, so what do you do to take it to the next level? This is, the Macmillan might be the example. Uh, we don't know yet because it's still filling in and that value is gonna change. So we'd recommend that for um, uh, for the community to basically to check this one again next year and it should pop up a little bit more. Um, Little Canada, now we're up to 560. Um, 
its peak is the lodge at about 5.6 million. Um, and again, there, there, here's the uh, um, a, a Grand Pre East at 2.6, Montreal 1.7, and Guardian. Those are basically the top four in that community. Um, here's White Bear Lake. White Bear Lake has a much higher peak value. So let's take a look at that. So this one peaks out at 5.6 million and is 500,000. Um, we've only gone up 100,000, but the peak is is almost almost triple. Um, and you can see it in the model. Um, so its peak is a two-story building. That's it. Is this hard to replicate? Um, so, but you can see White Bear Lake, it's kind of part of their DNA. So they've actually got a 9 million, 10 million, um, but basically you can see where their main street is right in their model. So how do we encourage those to happen? Why are, why are those other areas missing that stuff? Um, and in New Brighton, they've got a higher average value, but look at how much their peak drops down. So we've gone from a $12 million peak down to a $7.9 million peak. Now the average, the tide is much higher here because the average is about $50,000 more. Um, but its big winner is the, the view apartments at 5.5 million. Now remember, average single family is 900,000 out in the county. Um, so that's really, really potent compared to single family. And you can see it in the model, what's going on. Um, Roseville, we're at 6.8 peak and a 700,000. So the tide's going higher, but the peak still hasn't beat white, white bear. Um, and we're, go, we're at, uh, let's see, number one is uh, kind of a weird, architecturally weird building, but it's pulling $4 million of, of value per acre, the, the Sienna Green. Um, and here's the Rosedale Shopping Center by comparison, which is about half the value of Sienna Green. Um, and then St. Paul, I mean, this is a different animal altogether. This is your, your prime city. The numbers are going to be obscene. Um, 1.6 million. Uh, the average value, 109 million is their peak. Um, so, and that's all in the downtown. So for your project, we looked at a, a, a size, a, an area of non-taxable that could be converted into a development. So out in uh, um, Arden Hills, what would you do here? One of the lessons that we stole from White Bear was, could you introduce a downtown out here? Now, Now, one of the habits might be Hey Joe, people want single family housing. It's like, yeah, you know, who wouldn't want that? It's 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 an incredible gift of land for a very low value exchange. That's a subsidy. But, you know, if you were to do that, how would it crank out? So we just you know, will bust it out just an entire neighborhood of single family just so we can run a valuation on it and show you what it would be if you go down that path. So this is a choice. You could do 292 parcels, let's say 300 parcels out there um, with an average value uh, is actually better than average, uh, or sorry, it's 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 less than average of your average across the county. So it's only about 670 because that's what's going on in the marketplace out there. Um, your total value is 196 million. And so the second option, or there, here it is, here it is, you know, by comparison to the city, it's not much more than what's already out there. So from a from a value to area standpoint, it's a one to two ratio. So it's it's double the potency of its land area. Um, now there was a plan that you all have of a of a mixed use uh, project. So this is adding a lot more uses than just neighborhood residential, and with it you see a value effect. Um, so it's it's about a thousand units of housing, so it's more multifamily. Um, now remember you have 40% of your counties already in single family, so it's it's not like you're you're lacking uh, single family product. So you you could actually add more multifamily. But that pumps the value up to 1.8 million, and so you go from this to this. So it gets it gets thicker than what you have here, um, and that's a, a land area ratio of one to one to five. So now we've doubled the the potency of that product by doubling the stuff you're putting on it, basically. Um, so we took it to the next level and said, let's just go ahead and do, let's learn from White Bear Lake and let's bring a little downtown into this, a little mini downtown, a little little baby downtown out there. Um, and again, we're not doing single family because our bias going into this is you, you have enough of it. Um, and, and what these areas are lacking are those little foothills out there. 
So that now pumps it up to not much more, 1,400 units of housing. We're adding a little bit more commercial into it. Um, you know, uh, restaurants, bars, offices, things like that, that would be typical neighborhood center kind of stuff. But that kicks the value up to 2.5 million. So here's the bump that you get there. So now you start to see, you know, there's, if you look at this model of Arden Hills, do you really see where downtown is? No, it just looks like the same thing straight across the model. So you can actually add that in and build that place. So that's an opportunity for Arden Hills to grow up a downtown that it never had. Now, if it does that, it's going to have a, um, from a value to area ratio, that's a one to six ratio, which is about typically what we see for most downtowns. You saw that in, in St. Paul, it's a one to five. And there's two reasons why that's lower than one to six. One is because there's a lot of non-taxable, but also the general St. Paul tide is so much higher as you get closer to Minneapolis. Um, and that's the, the value effect of the Minneapolis St. Paul metro area and the density. But one to six is average for what we see. And we're just using examples from your community. These aren't like crazy big buildings. We're just doing like two and three story buildings in there. And even, even a little public common in open space. So just to put them side by side, these are the value ratios. So one to six is again, not that, that high for a municipality, it's about average. This is what your plan is. And this is what if you just did residential and these are the value effects. Um, so from a potency standpoint, all the same area, but look at how much different the value is. Um, and again, they're all going to have, there's a lot of, there's a lot of streets in here as well as all of these. So it's, again, just, these are just agnostic checks on the data to have a data driven discussion about this. Now we talked about redlining as well. Um, there's some maps that we pulled from the, um, mapping inequality, um, red line, if, 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 if it's red, it's bad. If it's uh, blue, or sorry, red is bad, yellow is not so bad, uh, blue is okay, and green is good. So there was for 30 years, uh, the, um, the, uh, the, the federal home lo loan program had these maps. They were drawn locally, but the, the maps basically dictated where investment would go. So if you were in a red area for 30 years, it was really difficult to get a mortgage. So that started to decay in the community. What also set forward this tidal effect that would go on for generations, including even today. So you can see these red line areas in and around the core of the city. Uh, this is typical for a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, cities. Again, it's, it was racist policy uh, created by the federal government, um, but there's a legacy effect to that. So mapping the race, uh, you can see a high density of, of African-American uh, communities with it, still within those red line areas, even though it stopped uh, being utilized as a process in 1960. So there is a legacy effect of this stuff. When we when we look at today, we have to go further up uh, the tide to see what waves hit you um, in, in the past. Um, there's odd stuff in the redlining maps, particularly for St. Paul, by the way. So across the river, this neighborhood, I mean, seriously, you can get the data and it says things like this, this ghetto district, uh, and it wasn't just African Americans that were hit by this policy. Oftentimes, it was frequently who's ever new to town. Um, you know, there, there's Italians got got hit by this too. Uh, but it was the African Americans were always an indicator for every city. But but in this case, you've got Russians, Jews, Mexicans, Chinese, and riffraff live there. I mean, you can see how subjective this is. You might wonder who riffraff is. So we went ahead and looked it up. R riffraff is a white rapper. From, uh, from Houston, in case you're wondering. Um, kind of a freaky looking dude, but anyway. Um, we applied your red line map to your city um, just to see is there still a value effect to this? And you can see the haircut that each district takes um, through this process. Now, this was predominantly applied to St. Paul, but again, that's your cousin inside your family that had this effect put on them. So it would, you know, I would, I would recommend that you continue this conversation with the city of St. Paul because they have to work on this. Um, now what you can do together uh, to solve or be anti-racist and solve some of these problems is gonna be the conversation going forward. Um, so here's the red line map. Um, and here we, we went ahead and added, we did this work over in um, Minneapolis as well. And you could see their red line map as well. Here's their downtown. Frequently downtowns were just like left out of it. They just it was like a donut hole inside the donut of application because it was more about getting people in housing 
So it was more applied to the housing districts than the downtown districts of the time. Um, but you can see, you know, Minneapolis did it as well. Um, they have a lot more blue and green areas than you do, um, but here's their their value effect. Now you can start to see that there's some growth going on in St. Paul. Those are mostly commercial and mixed use buildings. Um, so we'll strip out those uh, commercial rehabs or those fixes that have happened in the areas just to look at the residential area just so we can have a baseline. And you can see that St. Paul, um, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're less than your your yellow one. Your yellow areas are uh, not performing at the level of the the, the region. Um, so it's you hit your yellow areas harder than your red areas. Uh, but your red area is still not great uh, compared to the blue areas. So just you know just be aware of this that this has a, a legacy effect in your community. There's the Rondo neighborhood um, here, and and there's also other things that. It wasn't just redlining because after 30 years of hammering the community economically, our governments followed through with urban renewal, and that was another 20 to 30 years of of plowing in uh, to neighborhoods. And in the Rondo neighborhood, was hit, hit particularly hard with highways that they carved through the city, and basically eliminated a bunch of real estate. So those were neighborhoods that basically. Um, you know, we like to think of you could take all of those houses and you just transferred them out, you know, basically. And, and oftentimes it was punitive that individuals weren't given relocation funds, um, but they lost their property for the greater good, if you will, for building these highways. Um, but that's the Rondo neighborhood, the grid that used to be there. And actually all the way through the city, it was carved like a scalpel uh, through the area. Um, finally, one of the biggest lessons that we learned from you all was how you built over time. Um, and this is the, the fun thing about data that, that you can do. This is, we just went ahead and Will made an animation of how you grew the county. And, um, and, and basically you can see these are the different uh, age ranges of your community um, and your built. So let's just go ahead and animate this. It's kind of fun to watch this. So, you know, as you know, it's like, you built up St. Paul first, um, and you can see how dense that is. And then here we are in 1950, then it just gets kind of crazy out in the county. So let me uh, grab that. This is, let's just kind of, and we'll give this to you so you have this little animation because this is always fun to play with. Let's just put you at 1960. Look at how much county you built just from 1960 today, that's only like 60 years. Um, so from 1960 to today, you essentially filled in half your county in just that 60 year period. And you can go all the way back to the 1800s and fit your rest of your city in that. Um, so it's kind of a wild, you know, and basically the, the story here is you de-densified yourself. Um, so that which is a goal but also realize the consequences of that goal how much more infrastructure did you pull what's what did you do with your valuation what were the consequences to that um, because you're now paying for that it takes 50 or 60 years to for pipes and roads to start to come into a replacement cycle you're now going to start hitting that 1960 stuff so your your next your next 60 years is going to be replacing all that infrastructure you're going to be replacing half your county in the next 60 years of infrastructure. Um, so be aware of that because the developers, and it wasn't just you, they did it over in Hennepin as well. We did, we have theirs as well. Um, and this is this is an American phenomenon. We just went ahead and just uh, doubled down on our cities since World War II. And, and for you all, I don't know if you listened to Chuck Marone over in Strong Towns up in Brainerd, but he's done an amazing job bringing this forward. He's a civil engineer. Uh, we also tracked your employment and your jobs um, there's there's a really interesting story here in, in, in Ramsey about your jobs. You, in St. Paul, these are the recirculated jobs. People who live in St. Paul that work in St. Paul, it's about 47,000 people. St. Paul imports 150,000 people and they export 100,000 people. So those folks go out into either Ramsey County or uh, Minneapolis or wherever. Um, so when you look at, at Brighton, we start to see the same same lessons here, just at different scale numbers. They've got a recirculation, but the import and export is so much higher. 
when you look at Roseville, now remember these are predominantly residential areas, yet they're importing and exporting more people than they contain. So it's, it's kind of funny, like the pattern we're seeing is that I guess no one wants to work where they live. Um, so it's, it's a, I don't know why you're taking on these commuting patterns, uh, but we see it in White Bear Lake. Again, they're exporting as many people as they import and then the recirculation. Um, Vendley Heights, uh, same deal. Um, so when you look at throughout the county, um, you you import as many people or more people, 100,000 more people than you export and you recirculate around the county. So you're basically washing people around the county um, and then pulling in some people from outside. Most of those people are not coming from Hennepin. They're coming from further afield uh, in counties. But um, but there's a lesson here um, in that the, the people that you retain is the smallest pie slice in all of all of these pieces, all of your cities and your county. Um, so you might want to look to ask why on that or how to enhance that. Um, that's an opportunity. And then one fi final lesson is learn about your land use. Uh, these are from pl uh, planimetric data maps. How do you cover your land, um, your buildings, your roads, and your parking? Um, this affects valuation. So surface parking is incredibly low value because there's incredibly low improvement to it. And when you look at the area of your county, you've got pretty much as much square footage dedicated to parking as you do for buildings, which is crazy. Because your valuation, you're pulling all of your value from your buildings and very little from parking. And remember, roads are a liability. You got to pay for that. So that's a lot of expense for very little value in your parking. So remember that these two are basically the same area, but look at how much more you're getting out of your buildings. So when you require parking, you're requiring a subsidy. Do you hear that? It's like, if this is, what is that, close to 20 times more value than that, that means this parking is paying 1 20th the taxes a building is. And this isn't all big buildings. These are all your buildings in total, your 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 warehouses and strip malls and whatever. Um, so if you if you do denser buildings, you get a higher value portion versus that. So so learn from that and realize that parking isn't your friend. Uh, now we we pay for the roads, right? When cars move around, it's we're like Karl Marx. We're like everybody should have a road. But when it comes to parking, all of a sudden that's a private problem, and we force the property owner to put it down, and then we give them a gift of no taxes on top of it. Um, we modeled your sales tax data, and just so you know, this stuff is 2015 data. Uh, when we did the, uh, the the Hennepin County data, we were able to get this from the state. It was much more difficult this time around, um, but we went ahead and had your data, so we used it. So just be aware that this is old, but this is your, your sales tax productivity, um, and it ain't all in the malls. Um, so you can see that the downtown of St. Paul is highly productive from a sales tax uh, standpoint versus the monolithic malls. Um, and you can see how low Maplewood is. And again, our bias is, well, come on, Joe, it's a purely retail environment. It's got to be productive. It's like, well, no, it's just look at the data and it'll tell you what it is. And when we go to the malls, we're all there on the weekend. We're not there during the week when it's sucking wind, you know, and it's even worse after COVID. Um, but we went ahead and threw the, the Minneapolis one in so you could see it. And here's downtown Minneapolis and downtown St. Paul compared to Mall of America. So basically downtown St. Paul's punching at the sales tax productivity of Mall of America. And y'all know St. downtown St. Paul is not as robust as downtown Minneapolis. Um, so again, this is the, the data. Uh, and finally, the colleges. Uh, we just did a little buffer around each college just to see how the values look, just so the college may be non-taxable, but it's it's like a it's like an ocean. It will add value to the beach. So there are certain neighborhoods, if they're walkable, you're going to see a higher density of students or professors living in them, and it's going to be a value return adjacent to that. So you can, these are all just the different value bubbles around each campus. And you can see the suburban ones that are more auto-oriented don't really get a value effect or bump from that because those professors and whoever would pay a higher housing cost would move further out. Um, and then your infrastructure, these are your, your uh, county maintained roads. Uh, you have enough roads to go to Madison, but when we pull um, all of the roads in um, of all of, the, all of your cities 
and your county roads, it's a lot of roads. Uh, you know, so, and remember your, your kids and cousins that are in these towns that are within the county are gonna be suffering the same burden um, of infrastructure going forward. I, I'm gonna do a little time check here before I get into fiscal disparities. How are we doing? Thanks, Joel. Um, I think, yep, can we give it maybe, let's say, eight more minutes, and then sure. Ling Becker has an announcement, and then uh, we'll we'll leave a little bit of time for questions. So let's do about five to eight more minutes, if you can. Cool. Okay. So in, when we did the Minneapolis project, they asked us about fiscal disparities, uh, which is your um, it's a, a, a very MSP thing. I mean, it's actually awesome that y'all do this. It was basically revenue sharing at a regional level. So in the 1970s, y'all realized like we're all in this together. Let's work together. Um, I wish our community would do the same thing, but we're not as enlightened. Um, but it's you have a fairly complicated process of revenue sharing that's connected to uh, uh, commercial properties and um, uh, industrial properties. So right out the door, if you're a resident, you're not paying into it. So that's another subsidy that the commercial properties pay. So just to be honest with your citizens, the commercial properties and the res industrial properties pay into it. The residential gets the gift, right? So it goes to the government, these, these exchanges. These are the revenues produced. Um, and you can see like, you know, Minneapolis was really proud of how much they put into it. They're like, yay, we put in a lot of money. And I was like, well, not so fast. You also take a lot out of the pot once you put it in, put it in. So though Minneapolis puts in, they also take out. So this is the net model of the net, the net winner. So St. Paul is actually the biggest winner uh, of your community. So they St. Paul puts in 23 million, they take out 52 million, which is a net positive of 29 million. If you lift this model up like you're looking like you're a worm and looking up, um, Bloomington is actually the biggest loser at minus 12 million. So Minneapolis only loses about $3 million in the exchange. So that's like $3 million in the scale of their budget is is like the money that you'd find in your couch cushions or something for them. Um, this is just a scatter plot to show you the outliers of St. Paul and Minneapolis. But generally speaking, we can give you all of this data so you can see which municipalities are net positive or net negative um, in the model. So we just, we mashed this up for them. and. Um, one of the things that we want you to be aware of is the weird little biases that we see in the system. So one of the reasons why I was with, at the assessors conference was to show them this map. This is Cheyenne, Wyoming. This is only dirt per acre. So you expect the world to look like this. Everybody's got the same value per acre of dirt in this neighborhood. And I asked the community when I presented this, I said, why does this person here, why are they blue at 15,000? And when you cross the street, it doubles to 35,000. How by crossing the street does dirt double in value in the same zoning category? And everybody was just quiet. And then the tax assessor raised her hand and she just yelled out to me. She goes, no, 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 you don't get it. This person has a bigger par property and the bigger property means that there's less people that can afford buying that bigger par property. And if you have less people in the marketplace, that means it's a lower value. So the more property we have, the, the more property a person has, the lower the value per acre. I said, hold on a second. What about the three miles of real estate of, of road around this property versus the 200 feet? She goes, we don't count infrastructure as part of the valuation. So just to let you know, you all are running a corporation. There's somebody else out there with the sticker gun with this. That's their standard is the more property you have, they have, the more infrastructure you have, the lower the value. That's being set right into the assessment system. So I took this to the assessors and I asked them, their, their magazine is called Fair and Equitable. So I, I asked them, I said, when I get a bigger diamond, is it cheaper? Like, how is it you came up with this standard? Is it fair and is it equitable? Now to their credit, they just sat, sat back and laughed and they're like, it's not. I'm like, where did this come from? Did Moses deliver this to you? And they're like, we don't know. Now, how's that affect the market? It's gonna change the way that developers go after the real estate because I wanna take advantage of the most incentives that you give me. And that's an incentive to waste your real estate and waste your infrastructure. And when you look at your parcels, you're not as bad as a lot of communities that we've seen, but you still have some of the indications. Um, so let's kind of zoom in and take a look. Um, actually, you can kind of see it here where the out parcels around this larger parcel are so much more value than the large parcel. So again, this is a habit that's baked into the system of your assessors. And here's the 3D model of it. 
Um, so, you know, like why, why is this one little parcel right here so much more potent than everything else around it? What's up with that? So have a conversation with your assessor. Uh, this is a county staff member. Um, so this is how it all starts. Um, but share these models with them and just have a, and it's also something to learn from. One of the, one of our favorite things was the lake effect of what's going on with the real estate around the lake. And yes, you'd realize that if you're a lakefront property, you're going to have more value than your, than your neighbor across the street. But if you go over to White Lake or White Bear Lake, you can see that the value effect, because more people have access to that lake, more value transfers into the community. So putting them side by side, you can see if you, if you change the way that you think of design and give more people access to the amenity, you're going to get more value transfer into the community rather than just those that can afford the edge get the edge. Um, so just be aware of that. That's something we saw over in Hennepin as well, um, that the, the, the lakes that have better access get better value transfer. So I realize that these are all choices, uh, that the, the, the system of city and county that gets built isn't unconscious. These are policies, and you're making a policy choice decision that you're not going to have a greenway, an art teacher, or a dancing traffic cop if you put your subsidy in other forms. Your county is worth $54 billion, which is about, I don't know, what is that, uh, 30, 35 uh, Vikings? Um, your uh, St. Paul's worth 2.4 billion. I can tell you that Ziggy Wilf uh, knows the towel bill of uh, of Kirk Cousins. So what's a what's a mile of road cost? What's a pipe cost? You know we need to know these things. I can tell you the cups in our nightclub cost five cents a pop. So when you when you go forward from here, um, take a hard look at the implications of redlining and 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 what you need to do to provide more equity. Um, you know, equity serves as a double word here. It's equity to that individual, but it's all equity from a from a citizen standpoint as well. Um, understand what what the what the what the value conclusions are to go from a residential, uh, low density, medium density, high density, commercial low, medium high, to mixed use low, medium and high, and what you get out of it. You know, be be conversant in these price tags, if you will and what the value effect is. If you're saying we're just gonna do single family low density, you're saying yes to that and no to all this other stuff. You're saying you, you're, it's a, there's, a, there's a commodity exchange there. Um, thicken up, thicken up in St. Paul, but also thicken up in all of your communities because you're already paying for that infrastructure. Uh, learn from the lake effect and what you can do uh, around your community there. Again, these are all lessons from your own community. And also, uh, you know, not just in Saint, downtown St. Saint Paul, but out in the neighborhoods, equidistant out, there are some great examples that can be transferred. There's also great examples over in White Bear Lake that can be replicated on this parcel that you're currently considering, but also in other areas. Um, how do you build little hill towns uh, of value out in those places? And ha have those conversations with your peers in those cities about how, what you can do to encourage that growth because realize the county is going to get a return off that as well. And then finally start to solve this enigma of why do people not want to work where they live? <laughs> you know, it's like, is that a poll or a survey that you do? Um, and how do you minimize that trip? Because you're picking up that expense of exporting those people around um, on the roadways. So we call this geo accounting. You know, your accountant's not going to pass judgment on if you buy a boat, but your accountant cares if you can afford a boat. So, so understand what your decisions are and their consequences. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So start with all measurables, use these maps and data models that we created for you and do your math. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Joe. That was exceptional. Lots of data uh, this morning and um, I, I think we're going to just really quick pivot to Ling, who's going to show her screen. But um, as you're kind of digesting the information, feel free to put questions in the chat, and then we'll take those questions when Ling is done with her announcement. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, I know I've met with a lot of you to talk about um, our job board that we were hoping to launch here. Um, I apologize for the little bit of delay. I know I met with a lot of you in April and the goal was to get this out kind of late. 
May. Um, since that time, obviously, we continued to have our issues around COVID, um, the situation, and then also the civil unrest happened. And then we also are deploying a lot of CARES funding to the community, which is an ongoing effort that we're doing. So um, without further delay, um, Friday is the last day that lots of folks in our community will probably get this extra top off on the pandemic unemployment insurance. And so a great segue to the, what was just discussed about why you know getting more people to wanna to work in the community where they live is to help make that match for them. So this is um, gonna be um, officially launched by the county today actually around some press releases. Um, I have an email already for you all um, to follow up with that as to some messaging and the links that you can use on your website and social media as well going forward in the days and weeks to come. But I wanted just to quick show you a little bit of how it works. I won't go into a ton of detail, but this is the, the homepage. Um, you can get to it actually, this is the longer URL through the Ramsey County Means Business, but there's actually a shortened URL. It's just ramseycounty.us backslash um, job connect. Um, you can come in as a job seeker or an employer, but I wanted to scroll down here and show you these are all our business partners that we wanted to recognize. We've um, made some agreements and conversations with these groups that they will um, be promoting and using these um, this job board as well. So that's most of our chambers and um, economic development associations within the county. Um, for employers, when they come in, um, they are going to um, just really be able to just uh, easily enter in their work job opportunities. Um, the unique thing is they're going to be able to add, um, they can select which business organization they might be a part of so that we can kind of deepen that collaboration and cross promotion. Um, they also can upload their logo. There's opportunities to add additional files, social media information, video. So there's just a, a, a lot of robust um, information that they can put in pretty easily on their own. Um, from the job seeker end, um, there's a few bells and whistles as well. Um, if they come in as a job seeker, um, we're hoping cities will help promote to their residents, obviously. Um, you can search by industry, our keyword. You can search by location, so you can actually search by city. You can search by the type of job, and you can also search by if the if the job is on a transit line or if um, or not, or if it's on the green line. And hopefully we'll be adding more lines as we have more um, uh, more um, opportunities there. So when you look at the jobs, um, there's a unique feature when the person searches. Um, there's an interactive map. This is one of my favorite parts. If you have a touch screen, you'd be able to sort of do what I'm doing right now, which is kind of blowing up this um, board so that you can say, hey, I'm looking for a job and I want to work right along Highway 61. Like that's exactly the only place I want to look for a job. And you're able to do that as kind of in real time with a um, using kind of this map feature. You can click on these different nodes and actually see the jobs and go right to them. Um, and then down below is kind of like the listing of the jobs as they would go through the search. Um, I'll show you one here. Um, I know there was a, one with a video. So this Ecolab one, for example, they're looking for a finance person. So, you know, it has all the kind of the makings of uh, all the information they have, where to apply. And then they've uploaded, um, they've said they're on the green line. And then also, you know, they've uploaded a video as to why it's so great to work at Ecolab. So, um, you know, all this information is going out today, but we wanted to give you guys a little sneak preview since Carrie was already bringing you guys together. And um, just, oh, and then there's two extra features I wanted to quick just mention that um, we'll be um, hoping for your help as well. Um, we're going to be launching a new job seeker newsletter to county residents um, beginning first part of August. So here is a spot where they can sign up for that newsletter. I'll be sending you links that you can share out to your um, social media or your city newsletters. And then also we're building up a workforce training dashboard. I know a lot of you have maybe been um, familiar with dashboards and using this site, but this is going to give us an opportunity where people are going to be able to search by category. Like I want to look at construction training in the county and they'll be able to find generally uh, free community-based short-term training opportunities that are going to be available to residents. So we're in the process of getting this more fully built out. There's just a few things here now, but I would assume by um, early part of next month, there'll be over a dozen or more opportunities on here. So 
That's all I had, Carrie. I know I went through that really quick, but we'll send the links out today. Thanks, Lang. This is uh, an exceptional kind of branch of the of the Ramsey County Means Business site, and I know Lang, you worked pretty hard on it, so um, job well done there. Um, but we're excited about this launch. It's going to be be a pretty incredible service to our residents. Um, in terms of questions to Joe, we just have a few minutes here. I know. Um, will there be, Janice, will there be additional opportunities to explore the data Joe presented at the local level? I'm going to ask for those communities that were tuning in that would like uh, to understand their community a little bit better. If you could shoot me an email after this, uh, then we can talk about ways in which we can do that. Um, so there's, there's opportunities to do a deeper dive as part of the vision plan process, but I kind of also want to understand to what degree there's an appetite for more of a local deep dive as well. Um, and then uh, there was a question about uh, earlier on around small business grant recipients and if we can share that information with the municipalities. Um, I'm going to say at this time, I believe so. We'll check with MCCD on that. I believe that's public data. Uh, so we should be able to shoot those business lists over to the communities um, as well. Um, of course, just the name of the business and not their, their business information. But, you know, at this time, we've got about three minutes. Um, any other specific questions for Joe, feel free to mute, unmute yourself or put it into the, uh, put it into the chat box. This is Will from Urban 3. We got an excellent question from Commissioner Mata Castillo that I was trying to find a place to fit in that Joe can definitely answer. She noticed that the Winnipeg, the Plan B, uh, several of those high productivity buildings were in some of the poorest neighborhoods. And this is something we've seen a lot. So I think Joe can probably address that quickly. Yeah, there, there's a, uh, you know, a couple of things going on uh, in that. Well, one is, it is what it is from a value standpoint, and we're not making that up. Um, but what you'll find is there, um, actually, let me kind of, let me just uh, talk about Asheville for a second. Um, I noticed this uh, early on in Asheville, um, and this is before we started uh, before we started Urban Three. Uh, we're just poking around the city. This is this is my community. This is this is the governor's Western Retreat. So we bought the governor a house on top of a mountain, so that we could lure the governor up here occasionally because we're so far away from Raleigh. That we're like, hey, we've got a house for you. Come visit, um, and it's it's our equivalent of lakefront property. It's it's like on top of a mountain. Just down the mountain is this house here on top of the mountain with a tennis court. So it's not a stretch of the imagination to say this is a rich person, right? With who wants to be with the great unwashed playing tennis down in the valley when you could be on top of a mountain playing tennis? Um, this is from the uh, African American neighborhood of Jim Crow era. That's the Jim Crow. African American grade school, right across the street, you have uh, this house. Uh, not a spectacular estate, you know, three trees, uh, that's it. Um, this is my former house in West, West Asheville, which is our equivalent of Brooklyn. Um, it's, it's kind of the area across the river. Um, those are my dogs, they think they're lions. But um, when you look at the valuation, you've got low wealth, mid, middle income, and high wealth. If you just looked at the tax value, that's what you'd see. Now you'd say, okay, Joe, that's reasonable. Low, middle, high. If you take the buildings off the properties and just look at how the dirt is valued, just the dirt, this is the dirt value of these three parcels. And so I showed this to our county assessor and I said, Linda, what's up with that? Why is the poor African-American neighborhood so obscenely valued? Her response to me was, well, they use more police services. And I said, are you sure about that? Do you want to say that out loud in public? Do you have data on that? And she was like, oh. And I'm like, you might want to walk that back. And she's like, yeah, can I take that back? I said, yeah, you should take that back. But secondly, aside from the perversity of the dirt value, because I think the, the house on top of the mountain that we have to pump water to the top of the mountain should be the most valuable. I don't get an ocean view, a, a, a mountain view. And when you put the houses back on it, why am I paying the most? You know, and this, this is the thing is like, if you're not doing an apples to apples analysis, uh, you're, you're not seeing the biases that are in there. So I would ask, it's like, all right, well, if Winnipeg is a high crime area, you know, is does the neighborhood 
validate that? Is it is it over policed? Is it you know? Is, let's talk about what the fairness issues are there, and then why that valuation is there. But I'll tell you that the reason why those properties on Winnipeg are doing so well, one is the dirt value is really high, but two is a, a higher density. There's a lot more square footage on those properties. So even though they may be affordable or low wealth uh, individuals, they're 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 maximizing the utility on the property, um, and they're you know they're 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 paying for it. Um, so there, there are some biases that, that happen that you can start asking those questions to the assessor. And, and in the case of our assessor, uh, once she got her brain around it, she like realized like, yeah, I was, I was practicing biases rather than data. Um, and it's just, it's, again, this is a matter of public policy to have that conversation. And that conversation that I had here in Asheville, it wasn't like it was in the 1960s. This, this was just in 2009. I had that conversation. We had an African American president at that time. It was like we should have had been more enlightened um, in, in that conversation. Was Thank that too? You. Thank you so much, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, and thanks uh, for those hanging on uh, past the hour here. Um, exceptional presentation. Uh, lots to think about. I know there are many communities um, that are contacting me as we speak, uh, looking for more information on their community specifics. So we'll we'll talk about a strat strategy to do just that. But Joe, wonderful presentation, and uh, thank you all for uh, sharing your morning with us. And look forward to what may come. So. Um, We'll be sending out some information on the heels of this and do an e-news. This has been recorded, so please share this with your council members, your leadership within your communities. Uh, and if you have any other questions that may arise after this, shoot them my way and I'll make sure that Joe uh, and his folks get it as well. Um, but thank you all and appreciate the time. Joe, thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks for thanks for allowing us to work with you all. This was a lot of fun and I hope I hope we helped bring a different perspective to things. And we'll give you a, a map package of all of this so you have the actual GIS files. Um, I have no idea what that means. We'll can talk to you about that. And <laughs> I'll give you a, a PDF copy of this, uh, of this uh, PowerPoint. Um, so you'll have a copy of that as well. Perfect. Thank Thanks you so much. Thank you.